More wealth is lost by inaction than is lost by making bad financial decisions. That's Arion Shihai. Arion has helped investors buy properties in down markets, up markets, and high interest rate markets like we're seeing right now. So the financing has gotten way worse but the quality of the assets has gotten better. In this episode, you'll learn the old mindset that's keeping investors from buying properties today. People are looking at financing quality and asset quality, and they fuse them together. How experienced investors analyze investments today. Let's say if you buy a property and 500,000 and there's a $20,000 net operating income, you're getting a 4% yield on that money. How to figure out investor financing when interest rates are so high. Hey, to make this break even, I got to put 40% down. And you say, well, I don't have 40% down. And why waiting to invest is the worst strategy. If interest rates go down, the prices are going to go up. So you don't get to buy it at 2023 prices when the interest rates go down to four or five. And now we're going to dig into all of that and more. Arian, so there's this topic that I'm hearing a lot out there in the investing world, that the market has changed, that interest rates have gone up, prices have gone up, and all of a sudden, here in the end of 2023, early 2024, deals just don't pencil. What used to be an investing market where I could find real estate deals, all of a sudden, it's it's stopped. Like There's no deals out there. And so you're the man who could help me out with this, who could talk about this topic, what are what are some of the things you're seeing that 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 by, the causes behind that? Like what, what what are let's just talk let's talk about the landscape of the real estate market and why people aren't finding good deals today. Well, that's the understatement of the year, right? That <laughs> that uh, that's on the forefront of most investors' mind these days. And I think you and I get to speak to to a lot of investors from different points of view. But I think what they have in common is that everybody's thinking, hey, you know, I'm looking at these deals, you know, interest rates, you know, you'll see it on Twitter or or X now where people say, I just got a loan quote and it's eight and a quarter percent. And how am I supposed to make this deal happen at eight and a quarter percent or seven point seven five or what have you? Um, So essentially, the, the main issue that I see out there or that investors complain about is well, you know, the deals don't pencil anymore. You know, if you run numbers with 8% interest rate, they don't work, right? So there's this stalemate um, on the on the market right now where people are just not doing any deals because they just don't work for them, right? And and that's a, that's a problem because, you know, at the end of the day, um, as an investor, you know, you have to try to figure out how do you reach your personal goals through investing? And if you're sitting uh, idle on the sidelines, that doesn't help your cause. So that's the the issue that I'm hearing the most from investors these days is like, how do you, how do you make it work in this interest rate environment? What's the problem? Yeah, the temptation is to try to predict what's coming next and try to react to it and say, okay, things have changed. Therefore, I'm going to wait, for example, for interest rates to come down. Because if interest rates came down, then it would be like it used to be. And I could actually buy a property that penciled a little bit. Mm-hmm. What, we're, what, what I want to talk to you about, though, is that you and I both have a very similar long-term strategy that time in the market is more valuable than trying to time the market. Absolutely. And, and yet, we, have these, we, we can't ignore the reality of the, of the market. Interest rates are higher for investors. There, there, there are things that have changed, undoubtedly. But one, thing, one insight that you've had is that there's some things that have changed, financing in particular, but there's other things that are exactly the same or maybe even better on another part of real estate. So can you unpack how you look at this now? Because I think it'll help us all figure out how we can actually get back in the game and, and, and still buy investment properties. I mean, I can certainly understand the sentiment of wanting a certain outcome, right? Like I, I can understand like being in a high interest rate environment and saying, I wish 3% interest rates were back, you know, so that I could invest. The problem with that is that those outcomes don't happen in a vacuum, right? So I'll give you an example. So in 2021, if we were having this conversation in 2021, most investors were not complaining about interest rates then because they were really low. They were complaining about, oh, there's bidding wars and everybody's bidding over ask. And I, you know, I can't get any deals. Like it's so competitive out there. Prices are ridiculous, right? So at that time, the outcome that they wanted was for prices to come down, for the activity to, for the frothing to sort of 
calm down a little bit, right? And when that happened in 2023, people said, well, well, no, not like that. Like, I want the price to come down, but I want the interest rates to be like they were. And the thing is, how do you think the price are going to come down? Like, that is that is the mechanism by which, right, prices come down. So that's the part of it. It's the same issue now where if you think, okay, I'd like the interest rates to be lower, I can respect that. But understand that when interest rates are lower, the activity, on the other hand, increases and picks up too. So then you're back in 2021. So you can see how there's always a, a cycle. You know, you see that in flipping too, where if the market's great to sell, you can't find any deals to buy. But if the market's you know great to buy, then you can't sell them, right? So it's, there's always some problem that you have to solve because if there's no problem, there's no money. Like that's important to understand. If you're not solving a problem, there's no money in that industry at all, right? Because then the the competitive nature of it will wipe all the margins away, right? So so the issue right now is that you know when we're looking at deals, people are looking at financing quality and asset quality, and they fuse them together, and they're looking and they're evaluating deals through this lens, and it primarily comes from people being cash flow centric, meaning like they want they are looking at it, looking at a deal primarily from a cash flow perspective. Like, does the deal cash flow? What's my cash on cash return? All those things, right? And the problem is that the facts don't match what the people are, are saying. So, for example, they're saying the deals are getting worse. But how could the deals be getting worse if the prices are coming down? Right, the prices now versus 2021 are objectively lower than they were in 2021. So how are the deals worse now, right, when the prices are lower? The issue is that they are looking at it through the perspective of the financing. So the financing has gotten way worse, but the quality of the assets has gotten better, right? So that's the that's the problem that I see is that when you're evaluating deals through that combined lens, it's very hard to make good decisions on what your investments should be. Yeah, I love this perspective. Um, I remember having a mentor early on who, who used to tell me that real estate is kind of like a puzzle with two big pieces. And you could add a third piece like the people themselves, but you really have these two pieces. You have the sticks and the bricks. You've got the actual real, real estate right. that's physically sitting on a lot that's in a physical location. It's in Houston, Texas. It's in Manhattan, New York. It's in Clemson, South Carolina. Like It has a physical location. It has a sticks and bricks. It has a building on it. And that's the quality of that is one way you analyze real estate. But then there's this other piece of the puzzle, which is the money, the financing. And those, those always have to fit together. And so what I'm hearing you say here is that the financing quality has deteriorated and that the interest rates have gone up. It's been more difficult to make a, a deal work because we, we're kind of using the same paradigm we had on financing from three years ago or two years ago or one year ago. But on the other hand, the sticks and the bricks and the property, and we, we could talk about how to analyze that, that's actually gotten better because the prices have softened up some and there's, it's easier to get those high quality assets now. That, that's essentially what we're talking about, right? Correct, yeah, and, and I mean, I can understand, like some people hearing this might be like, well, it's great for you to split hairs like that, but at the end of the day, when I'm evaluating this deal, it either has to work or it doesn't. But think about, think about it a different way, right? So. Let me ask you a question. Is it possible to buy a bad asset with good financing? It is, right? So in 2021, right, so many people bought bad assets, whether they were not located in the right place or, you know, they were inferior assets, but the financing quality was so good they could get 3% interest uh, on, the, on the debt. So they bought bad assets with good financing. And it's also possible then to buy a good asset with bad financing, right? So the two things have to be separated because if you don't separate the two, uh, you know, because a lot of times people say, well, I don't care that the asset quality that I bought in 2021 wasn't all that great because my financing is fixed. So who cares, right? Like my cash flow is going to work. But that only works when the economy is good, right? Once the economy turns a little bit and you start to have a recession, that's when the asset quality matters because when you know rents drop or when uh, demand falters the best assets win right so if you're in this for the long term 
that's where the asset quality will make sure that you survive and you stay in the game longer. I know nobody's thinking about that right now because rents always go up and prices always go up and everything's great, right? But when the market turns, that's when we find out who has the quality in their portfolio and who doesn't. So that's what I'm asking you to do is I'm, I'm not saying financing doesn't matter. I mean, that, that would, be, it would be naive to say that. But what I'm saying is set it aside for the moment and evaluate the asset separate from the debt, right? Evaluate the sticks and bricks and figure out, you know, what's the location quality? Uh, what's the job growth in the area? What's the population growth in the area? What's the tenant demand? How landlord friendly is the state? It's like all those factors that determine whether an asset makes a good investment or not have nothing to do with financing, right? Those have to do with the sticks and bricks. So evaluate that first, right? And then look at the financing second because the financing is a mechanism by which you acquire the asset. But first you must determine, should I buy the asset or not? Does it make sense to invest in this or not? Yeah, hundred percent. So, if you're okay with this, let's go kind of go, let's go down to a one-on-one level of mm -hmm. evaluating real estate. Like, I, I think this will be helpful for everybody. We just take a step back. Anytime things change, let's go back to the one-on-one level. We're going to mm -hmm. look at how to how you and I would evaluate a property, how you and I would evaluate the financing. And I promise people, if you kind of stick with us here, we're going to bring it back together. With the takeaway here will be, what's our strategy going forward? Like, how mm -hmm. can we today? go out and evaluate deals and figure out a new lens, a new way to evaluate them. So let's start with the, the, the I like the way you define an asset quality. What are some of the criteria? You just listed a few just right there. If you're sitting down with a client, if you're sitting down on your own investment property, like what, what are some of the ticker, the list of things that you would prioritize to say, this is a high quality asset? Well, I, I'm in the camp that um, I think spreadsheets tell stories. You know, they're, People think they're numbers, but to me, they're stories in the sense that when you look at the different components of a, of a income and expense statement for a, for a property, they tell you different things about the asset, right? So, um, so everything starts with the income, right? So the first thing you want to determine is what's the reliability of that income, you know, because you could underwrite anything with whatever numbers you want to underwrite, but the question is, how likely is that are you to get that rent? Meaning, what's the tenant demand like? Um, what's the like supply and demand in the area? Like, are there a lot of rentals in the area, and you're sort of fighting off, and it's a it's a race to the bottom when it comes to price, or is it you're the only one on the block, or there's another guy and there's ten people looking for that asset to rent? So that's the first thing that I want to see is like how reliable is the pricing on the rent, and how um, how reliable is that going forward? Like if the market were to change, how will that try to figure out how will that um, behave in different market conditions? So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, that comes in the spreadsheet is the vacancy, right? So I want to see, okay, you know, I can plug whatever number I want in there, but I want to be accurate when it comes to vacancy. So I want to say, hey, is this a 10% a year vac vacancy market? Is it a 3%? Is it, will I get a tenant that will stay there? eight to 10 years, like some of my tenants have stayed. So that's what you want to determine. That's the second part. Is that a, is that a commercial kind of, you go to a commercial agent or an investor agent like you, who do you have those in your, in your records? Or is that something you have to sort of just kind of tell your own story and say, okay, if a property is vacant once out of every two, one month out of every two years, that's four or 5%. Like how, how, how do you actually figure that out? So, so there's an empirical way of doing it and there's the experience way of doing it, right? So the empirical way is, when you're running comparables in a neighborhood for rent, and let's say you go back a year, then you can sort of see how many days on market it took, right? And then you, you could find the listings that are most comparable to yours and average out the days on market for all those listings and divide that by 365. And that's your sort of like what the vacancy has been in, in the last year. So that will give you a good idea of like, what can you expect in the, in the immediate term? where experience comes in is like, hey, what did that neighborhood do five years ago? What did it do in 2008? What did it do in 2010? You know, sort of have that narrative. And that, I mean, I wish there was a spreadsheet for that, but that just comes from experience and dealing with somebody who has been there, um, was an investor during that time and kind of saw it uh, happen. Yeah, these stories, I love the, the 
looking at real estate as a story, the tenants, a story, why they live there is a story, why they want to stay there is a part of their life story. You know, real estate's all about people and they translate to these numbers and they, they, the spreadsheet does tell, tell a story. And va vacancy is one of those things, like the lowest vacancy properties I have are the highest demand properties. Like they, people want to be there for, for some reason. It might be because it's next to the botanical garden. It might be because it's, it's walkable cool. to campus. The schools are really important. So all, all of those things that we, we kind of know intuitively because we've lived in neighborhoods, we've lived in towns. I always tell people like real estate's a pretty cool investment and in that you're not having to figure out like what some uh, biochemical technology, how that works no. like that. That's hard to understand. Simple. Real estate, real estate is pretty simple. It's like, why do people live here? Why do they want to stay there? And just, you know, just tell the story about it and you can figure out which properties fit into that kind of market narrative the best. Right. And that's, you know, with, with the empirical way, you're getting sort of an aggregate of the market. Then there's other factors like how good of a manager are you, right? Or how good is your property manager? Because you could have, you know, the market could have a 30 day on market, 30 days on market at time to lease, but your manager might be poor. So they might get at least in 60 days or in 90 days because they just don't try very hard. So there's other factors, but that, that's a good starting point, I think, on the vacancy side. Got it. All right. So we're still evaluating the asset, the property mm -hmm. itself. We start with income. You can think about this as an income statement, income, yeah. vacancy. What, what else do you look at to understand so the, then, the value of an asset? Then you have the operating expenses. So the operating expenses are property taxes. I wish we could abolish them, but we can't. Uh, insurance, property insurance, homeowner associations, uh, dues, uh, repairs, um, and then any utilities that the landlord might might pay. So those are the the expenses to operate. So you will notice that I didn't mention the mortgage payment there. The debt has nothing to do with operating the property. This is just what does it what does it cost to operate this property? So you look at the the property taxes. You look at the insurance and the story. Going back to that analogy, the story in the property taxes is and the operating expenses is like is this a, a high expense t type of property to operate or is it a low expense and neither of them is good or bad it's just you have to understand what it is because some of my best properties are high expense uh, high operating expense properties that's because the schools are excellent so the school taxes drive the operating expenses so um so it's not necessary that if the if the operating expenses are high you don't want to do the deal but you just want to understand like you don't want to get high operating expenses and not get the benefit on the other side uh, on the property. And the other thing is underestimating those or just getting them inaccurate. I've, I've done it myself. I know a lot of people have done it. If, if you underestimate maintenance repairs and you think you're making two or $300 a month and you, or you think you're going to break even, right. and then all of a sudden now you're negative three or 4,000 bucks a year. If you're, if you're tight on your budget, that, that could be a problem. So, so just not, not being accurate with them is a big issue. I mean, you, you underestimate with things like repairs, you underestimate what they're going to be. Um, and for, for this, personally, what I do is I feel like if you know that something's an expense is coming, it's more palatable than if it just sort of comes out of left field. So one of the things that I usually track across my portfolio is um, the age of things that tend to break and cause most of the repairs. So I track the, the age of the roofs on the properties, the age of the uh, HVAC systems, the boilers and water heaters. Um, you know, all those things are, are things that almost break in a predictable fashion. You know, so if I know that, hey, you know, I've got a couple of 20 year old HVAC units, chances are at least one of those is gonna, is gonna visit me this year. Right. So I prepare ahead of time and set set money aside for that. And I think that makes it more because I think it's more of a I mean, it sucks to have to pay the expense, but the feeling of being out of control is worse. Right. Where yep. you feel like you're getting hit from all directions. All right. So we've got this income. We've got this these expenses. What, what's next? So, so that leaves you with your net operating income or which is a fancy term for the income the property makes if you owned it free and clear. Uh, and then from this net operating income, you then have to pay the mortgage debt, right? Uh, and then that, the the subtraction of those two gives you the cash flow at the end of the day. I've always told people when I talk about NOI, the net operating income, that this to me is one of the most important numbers in all of real estate. Absolutely. Like if I if I if I could accurately get to this number, forget the debt for a while. You know, like this is the 
this is this tells me the whole story from a financial standpoint of whether this asset is a is going to fit my goals or not. So, but, but can you explain? Can you go further into that? Because I, I think that's really important. You think it's really important. We haven't even talked about financing yet. Like, what can we do with this number in OI that tells us so much? Like, what is it telling us? Well, so what it's telling you it's um, the yield on the property if you owned it free and clear, right? So what it's telling you is that. You know, let's say if you buy a property and the property is, um, you know, five hundred thousand, and there's a twenty thousand dollar net operating income, that means you're you're getting a four percent yield on that money, right? So this is a critical point because that is, in my opinion, how you should evaluate the quality of the asset. Because it's not a matter of like, well, you know, there's this yield number that you must hit. It's a matter of Risk adjusted yield is what you want to evaluate. Meaning, if I have an asset that it's in a prime location, class A, great tenants, low headache, right? I'm willing to accept a lower yield for that than if I have an asset that is more volatile, more crime, more um, adventure, as I like to call it, right? Then I'm going to want a higher yield to account for that uh, extra risk, right? So I think in this current interest rate environment is very critical for an investor to evaluate and figure out what is the yield, the minimum yield that I'm willing to accept for an asset in this category, right, in order for me to move forward in my, in my analysis, right? That could be 5%, it could be 6%, it could be 7%, it could be 8%, whatever you want it to be, right? But that is the yield that, you know, you must establish because if you don't, Right then, then you're sort of, kind of in the wind, right? Like you, you're, you're, you, you don't have a very clear way of evaluating whether a deal makes sense for you or not. Now, this is critical to understand that this number is not your cash on cash return. So, for the people who are hooked on leverage returns, right? You're like, well, I don't want to make six percent. I don't want to make seven percent. But again, keep in mind that the six or seven percent without a mortgage on it is not the same as six or seven percent with a mortgage on it. Like you obviously you would never accept a six or seven percent rate of return on a leverage deal, right? But if you have a free and clear property, right, then you have to figure out what that yield is that makes sense for you. Ultimately, investing is about options. Right? It's about income, but it's about options. Because if you have options in the future to to make moves, then you're going to be able to take advantage of opportunities better in the future. Look look at it this way. If you buy a property and let's say you get it at a 6% yield, right? And you, let's say you pay cash for it and you hold it for the next four or five years and then the rates go down to five. Well, now you have the option of putting debt on that property, pulling the money out and then going and buying more properties. But if you didn't do that, right? Then the time will just pass you by and then you don't have that option when the debt is lower. And then when the debt is lower, now you're having to, to access the asset at a much higher price because now everybody wants the asset, right? So the idea is this is the way of having the cake and eating it too, where you get the asset at a, at a really good price, right? Now that the financing is not available and then you can put the financing on it later when it becomes more advantageous for you to do that. So really we're kind of, we're starting to put a, a strategy together for people to think about. Like if you're going to go forward here and we're going to dig into the financing side a little bit too, number one, step one, evaluate the asset. We kind of went through a little bit meticulous detail there. Like it's just you got to figure yep. out a net operating income. You got to figure out the yield. But even before that, you've got to think qualitatively about this property, this location, and say like, what kind of location do I want to do? I want to invest in? Do I want to invest in like the higher quality part of my market, which is probably going to mean a lower yield? Mm -hmm. Do I want to invest in more an adventurous property that might have you know some value add needed? It might have some location issues. That's fine too if people want to do that, but you have to say what's the minimum yield I'm willing to accept for that. And really, the game we're playing here is there's a bunch of other investors out there doing the same thing, and we're competing with them. And there's a market yield that people are willing to pay in all those different asset classes. And so, really, the game we're playing is trying to do a little bit better maybe than the market, but at a, at a at, at, you know, in, in essence, we're trying to figure out the kind of asset we want that's going to help us move forward. And then step two, which we'll get to is then we figure out the financing, whether that's partnering with people who have cash, whether that's paying a large down payment so that we can make this in cash flow. Like, that's the second step, because well, often well, people, taking, people start with her. Yeah, you're taking advantage of the opportunities that the market's giving you, right? Like you're hitting the balls that the, the, 
the pitcher is, is sending your way. So yeah. I'll give you an example. So in 2008, 2007, right, you could buy properties that were, you know, in our market, single family homes for 90,000, 100,000, right? And they were at that time leasing for 1,100, you know, so it was a, a really good price to rent ratio. But people forget that from 2008 till 2012, maybe 13 for some areas, there was no value growth at all, right? So, so if you were somebody that said, hey, I'm buying properties because I want them to go up in value, right? That five years was a lost half of a decade for you. But the thing is, once the growth did kick in on 2012, then it was all history. But you had to be in the game. In other words, you had to acquire them in 2008, 2009, 2010 at those prices that were only available then and sort of endure the, the four or five years of, you know, not great growth uh, that was there so that then you could ride the wave up. In other words, you don't get, you don't get to do both. You don't get to buy the 2013 at 2008 prices. Like, that's not how it works. You have to be able, just like, just like right now, like, the prices are what they are. If interest rates go down, the prices are going to go up. So you don't get to buy it at 2023 prices when the interest rates go down to four or five. So that's the idea is, like, how do you get to participate in the market and get a reasonable yield for the risk that you're taking while you wait for the opportunities for the options that will open up for you in the future. So let's talk about that. So I think you've done a great job of explaining part one, asset quality, evaluate, choosing the type of properties you want, choosing a yield that makes sense for you. Part two is you have to be able to hold on to it to get to the, the benefit to the, and, and financing has everything to do with that. So how, how can we rethink how we finance properties in a market like this where we can take advantage of that? So when you think about uh, finance equality, just like for the asset quality, you're thinking about location and, and tenant demand and so on. For financing quality, you're thinking about, well, what's the interest rate? Uh, what's the down payment? What are the loan terms? What, what are the, what's the flexibility there? What could I do with what, what the financing options are there? And really what I look at is, you know, you have to find a point of equilibrium in your financing. Right? And I think that's where the, most of the issues are. Like when people say, well, the deal doesn't pencil, right? What they're really saying is the deal doesn't pencil with 20% down or the deal doesn't pencil with 25% down, which are the down payments that I'm used to or the down payments that I've been able to take advantage of for the last five years or 10 years, right? But the thing is the market changes. You know, people have very short memory, like in 2006, 2007, you could finance investment properties with 10% down. And then they changed the rules where they made it 20% down. And there were some people that were waiting for the down payment requirements to go back to 10% down, and that didn't happen, right? So that's part of the issue is that people are, investors want uh, the deals to work at a certain down payment level, and the market has shifted from that. So what you have to figure out is in your market, it's great if, you know, Fannie Mae has a 25% down payment, minimum down payment uh, marker. And it's great if you could make it work at that and take advantage of the maximum leverage that that offers. But sometimes the market shifts. So you can't make it work at 25. It might take 30, it might take 40, it might take 50% down. And you say, well, wait a second, I don't have 40% down or I don't have 50% down. But by saying I don't have those things, then that gives you an action to take. Right? Because ultimately, in, in my opinion, more wealth is lost by inaction than is lost by making bad financial decisions. So like the people that sit around on the sidelines waiting for this magical combination of outcomes, like a low interest rate environment, and also the prices are low, and also the rents are high, and also people aren't losing their jobs, and the economy is doing great, and the stock market... Is, is all flowers and butterflies. It's like, it's not going to happen, right? So what you have to do is you have to figure out how do I make it work? What is the new point of equilibrium for the financing to make this work? And as long as you can find the next action to take, then you are, you, you're always moving forward. So for example, you know, let's say you've saved 20% down to purchase a property. And, and you, you run the numbers and you realize, hey, to make this break even or to make this 
give me a, a, a reasonable cash on cash return, I got to put 40% down. And you say, well, I don't have 40% down. Well, that means you either, you know, do a side hustle thing to try to make more money or save more money for the down payment. It means you can look for a capital partner that could partner with you. You know, there's, there's actions that you can take. And as long as you can take those actions, you can, like, it's okay to do fewer deals with lower leverage than you're used to. It's, it's actually preferred and better than not doing any deals because you need to do them at that down payment, at that leverage level that you're accustomed to. So th- there's no, there's no like freebie, you know, there's always a, there's always a, a give and take there. But the point that I think is hope is driven home, which I think is brilliant on your part, Arian, is that this old mold that was working before is not working. Life is changing. The economy is changing. The financing market is changing. If you want to stay in the game and not make that big mistake of inaction, you've got to change your approach. I mean, in the words of Fat Joe, yesterday's <laughs> price is not today's price, right? And it's a lot easier to understand with pricing than it is with financing. So I'll give you an example. Like I had a, one of my oldest clients. Uh, she bought a bunch of properties in 2008, 2009, and they, she was buying properties for 100000 like little like one story, three bedroom, two bath homes that were five, six years old. Well, fast forward six years later, I found her a deal that was next door to one of the properties that she had paid a hundred for, but now the price was 160. And she's like, well, I can't bring myself to do that. But I said, hey, the rents are not what they used to be. So why should the price be the same? And the fi- with financing is the same way, right? Is that, you know, you can't make it work with the same parameters when interest rates are 8%, you know, as, as you could when they were four or when they were three. I mean, it, you know, we can cry all day long that they should be three, but we really need to deal with what they are and what the reality is. So I want to be devil's advocate for a moment. And if somebody's listening to this, they're like, okay, I got to change my approach and maybe let's stick with it, make a larger down payment type approach. I, maybe to pencil it, I got to put 50% down on the type of quality asset I like in the market I'm in. So I figure out a way to save up more money. But then I say to myself, like, like I'm trying to accomplish financial independence here. I'm trying to get a financial freedom. And I was always under the impression that I needed to like get the max return on investment possible. So if I'm putting $50,000, I'm doubling my down payment. I'm doubling my investment in this property, mm-hmm. but I'm not really getting any more cash flow or I'm, or I'm getting the same amount of cash flow with twice the investment. How am I going to accomplish financial independence? Because I'm looking at my return on investment, my return on equity that I'm putting into the property. You're the investing architect. You're helping people navigate this. On the, so how do we actually still accomplish our big picture goal five, 10 years from now if we're having to put more money into the deal right now? Because the, it's a question of timing, right? So it's, it's, I, I agree with you that you should try to maximize your return on investment, but the question is when, right? In other words, if I, like, let's take an example. Like I buy a property, I put 50% down, right? And I operate this property through this, financing storm, right? Like I, a little boat goes through the storm. And then then I'm able to go in and put, you know, refinance and put lower interest debt on it, pull the money tax-free and I go do another two or three deals with that money. Am I maximizing my return on investment better than somebody who didn't do this at all? In other words, how does not doing anything at all maximize your return on investment? Because you know, let's be clear, the the destination that that thinking leads to is to do nothing, right? If you think, hey, I can't make it work because I got to get, you know, 15% IRR, uh, inter- internal rate of return on my investments all the time, and I got to get it now, even though I'm not re- you know, trying to get financial independence for another 10 years, right? That will lead you, like the logical conclusion of that thinking is you should do nothing right now and wait for the time when you can get those deals that give you the 15%. But the problem is, in order for you to get the 15%, the interest rates have to come down. And when they come down, the prices go up, right? That's supply and demand. So then now you're waiting for the prices to come down. So it's like, it's a cycle. And, and throughout the cycle, you're doing, you're taking no action, right? So my, like, would I prefer right now to have 3% debt and do the deal at, you know, do a, a bird deal where I can put three and a half percent down, live on one side and maximize. Yeah, sure. Right. 
But in the absence of that, what's the best alternative? The best alternative is to figure out what's the new point of equilibrium is, you know, get the deal done because it's a good asset quality that fits you with your portfolio and your long-term goals. And then you can get creative when the market offers you those opportunities later because now you'll have this asset that you can, you know, hopefully has grown in value by that time, has the mortgage has gone down, so you've created some equity, and now you get to pull that equity at low interest rates and then redeploy it again. So the overall, so it's, our goals are the same, but the approach is different, right? It's, it's the approach of inactivity versus figuring out and adapting to the current market. The fundamentals of real estate haven't changed. Like real estate quality, people want to live in good locations. They want to go to certain school districts. They want to go near the neighborhood where they can do the thing they want. Like life is still happening in this real estate market all over the country, but financing changes. They, and, and this is almost, I was wondering, Arian, like how I would kind of frame this episode, when we, what we we're going to talk about. This is almost like stoicism applied to real estate investing. It's like stoicism, this ancient kind of Greek philosophy that says there's some things under your control. Yeah. There's some things that are not. The whole, the whole name of the game of life is figuring out which things are under your control. Like the, 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 the financing, we can't change. That's in the can't control category. But we can control whether we invest or not. We can control whether we put a certain amount of down payment or not. We can control going out and finding capital partners. We can control trying to find seller financing on some certain deals. Like there's a long list of things we can do. And that's, that's the message I'm taking from you today, Arian, is that there's it's an optimistic tone. It's like, hey, like we can't change that stuff, but the, the sitting on your hands, throwing your hands up and, or doing whatever to say, I can't do this is not the option. Like if you actually want to achieve financial freedom, there are people in this market, your clients, you yourself, me, people I know, students are, we, we're buying. Like we're, I, I bought a single family house this year, paid cash for it. I like the yield on it. I love the location, it's near elementary school. I'm a buyer. I bought an eight unit building with a partner in a really good location. When everybody was calling the Airbnb, Airbnb is crashing. And this is a uh, eight unit boutique hotel in Kalispell, Montana, in an amazing location, walkable to breweries on the road to Glacier National Park, high quality building. I mean, so I'm buying like this is this is a good time I, yeah, to buy I, I because it's a, a quality asset. I bought a duplex myself. It's if you look at it from a return investment this year is my lowest performer of all. But I'm OK with that because the yield that I got, the price that I paid for it makes sense to where. I'm going to be laughing when when the debt uh, picture changes because there's going to be so many options of what I could do with with the equity on that property uh, and and how I can like use it as a springboard to do more deals. Um, yeah. But one thing I wanted to also point out is that um, every time that there's a, a storm, whether it be a like a economic recession or anything like that. Uh, you know, it brings me back to 2008, where there was this episode where me and my wife would wake up in the morning and be, get ready for work, and we would turn on the TV and it'd be like CNN or some some news channel, like for for no reason, right? It would just be on right through the morning, and by the time we finished getting dressed, like there was no point to go to work because it's like the world is crashing and Lehman and this and that. And it's like there was no point in in even doing anything. So one day we're like, why don't we just turn this off, right? And we just turned it off. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, back to your stoicism idea, like we focus on what we could control. Like we, we, we had nothing to do with Lehman. You know, we could just go focus on what we were doing, right? And, and I think part of, uh, like with financing, a lot of what people are hearing is through like media narratives. You know, it's like every week there's like some story about how the interest rates are, you know, hit a new high point and they're now eight point whatever. And, and what, the thing to understand is that those are aggregate numbers and they are numbers like national numbers also, right? So like, I'll give you an example that there's a lot of builders, for example, that are doing things that are creative when it comes to financing because they, they can. So I've seen, for example, builders in my area do rate buy downs for their, for their buyers where they, some of them will do like a three, two, one rate buy down, which means that the interest rate is lower by 3% the first year, lower by 2% the second year, lower by 1% the third year. And the idea behind that is that, you know, rates should come down in three years so you can refinance. I'm not a huge fan of that idea because 
you can never count on the, on things like that. Um, but that's one option. Another example is a builder that I work with, uh, where we sell you know investment duplexes. They're doing this thing called forward commitments, which is when they go to a lender and they say, "Hey, I want to offer my investors 4.75 percent financing. I want to offer them five and a quarter percent financing." What do I have to do to get a certain amount of money that I can use it to then lend, you know, to well-qualified borrowers? So basically, the builder is going and subsidizing on the back end, so that then they could offer that type of financing. So my point is that don't like, don't take the media narrative of what the interest rates are and say, well, that's the only thing that's available, because there are people doing creative things in the space, you know, where you could still kind of turn the clock a little on the on the interest rate if that's you know if that's something you're trying to do. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. I, 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 we started this talking about the problems are out there. They're real. Like we're, we're not going to have like rose colored glasses on here mm-hmm. saying interest rates are going to go back down anytime soon. Prices aren't going up. They are like this is an interesting market. Things have changed. But my, my I think this is a really good frame of mind, though, for people to think about asking the question, how can I make it work? Asking myself the question, What's the quality of the asset? Asking myself the question, what's the quality of the financing? Separating those two ideas. This has been amazing, Ariane. I want to give you a chance to, to pass it off to everybody else if they want to follow up with you. Where can they find you? Where can they hang out with you uh, if they like this episode? So they can find me on uh, Twitter or X, uh, Invest Architect there. Uh, investingarchitect.com is the, the website and also on YouTube. I'll have links to all that in the video description and the show notes as well. It's always my pleasure talking to you. Thanks for, thanks for being here, Arian. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you, sir.